Well, hi, everyone. Good to have you here. We're ready to start chapter four. So again, like I always do, share the PowerPoint. We're going to be talking about prokaryotes in this chapter primarily. We remember that all living organisms come from pre-existing organisms, right? And these first few slides simply talk about the fact that when we take a look at, at cells, that all living cells have characteristics that um, are shared, that they have a particular shape, and with respect to prokaryotes in particular, which of course is what we're focusing on in this chapter, um, in the latter part of the chapter, we'll talk a little bit about the, the common shapes of bacteria. Right now, you ought to be familiar with the round coccus, the rod-shaped bacillus, and the spiral-shaped spirilla uh, morphology. And we'll be looking at that in lab shortly too, when we look at them under the oil immersion objective. We're going to talk about a cell membrane and a cytoplasm. So thus far, it sounds similar to a eukaryotic cell, doesn't it? And prokaryotes, of course, do have a cytoplasm. They do have a cell membrane, but they have other structures that are unique to prokaryotic cells. As we know, we, they don't have membrane-bound nuclei. They don't have a nucleus. That doesn't mean they don't have nucleic Acid, they do, they have DNA, and we're gonna take a look at that in just a few minutes. Um, we described, again, the difference between prokaryotes and eukaryotes as the prokaryotic cell lacking the membranous nucleus in many organelles, while eukaryotic cells, of course, have membrane-bound mitochondria, Golgi bodies, lysosomes, et cetera, et cetera. And we'll be spending a lot of time in chapter five on the eukaryotic cells. But you should know the fundamental difference between the two, which by now I'm sure you do. Um, this particular figure simply describes the fact that all cells have the ability to reproduce, that they grow and develop, that they respond to uh, environmental cues or chemicals, that they uh, involve uh, the movement of materials across their cell membrane, so this is just sort of a general guideline that we ascribe to all cells, whether they're prokaryotic or eukaryotic. So what this chapter does, and I think they do a good job um, in organizing the structures by looking at the prokaryotic cell, which remember um, belongs to either the domain bacteria or the domain archaea breaks them down into three major structural um, schematics, external structures, the cell envelope, and internal features. So in this first um, PowerPoint presentation, or Zoom lecture, I should say, uh, we're going to focus on external structures, and we'll probably get into some of the cell envelope constituents. In the second PowerPoint lecture, um, we'll cover the internal features of the prokaryotic cell. So here we've got a diagram, figure 4.2, that does a really excellent job sketching some of these various features that describe, again, external or internal components. So if you ever get confused as to what we're talking about, you can always refer back to this figure. I think the author uh, has done a really nice job in providing a visual representation of, of many of these uh, important structures. So we're gonna be focusing on those uh, in the next few lectures. Let's start off with the external features. Well, we know that eukaryotic cells, some eukaryotic cells have things called cilia. And some eukaryotic cells, like sperm cells, have flagella. Well, in the case of prokaryotes, there aren't cilia, but there are other external structures like flagella 
that allow for a variety of functions. In the case of the flagellum, it involves motility or movement. But we're gonna also talk about some other things called axial filaments or paraplasmic flagella that some bacteria have that allow them to move. And we'll also talk about other structures that, that have no role to play so much in movement as they do in helping the cell attach itself to some substrate um, or to provide a channel across which materials like DNA can move from one cell to another. So let's focus first on the motility function of appendages that some bacteria possess. Not all of them do, but some of them do. And the first one is the flagellum, which would be singular. Flagella, of course, is the plural term. And as you'll see in a moment, some bacteria may only have a single flagellum, while others may have multiple flagella extending from their cell surface. When we look at a flagellum, we can see the three major structural components as illustrated there in purple. The filament shown here in green, which is made up of a, an elastic protein called flagellin. External to that, a hook, which sort of is an external feature covering the elastic flagellum, the protein in the core in the center. And then this hook is in turn embedded within the cell wall and or the cell membrane of the bacterium. Now we'll be getting into differences between gram positive and gram negative cell walls a little bit later, but this is your first, uh, or maybe not the first time you've heard of it because we did talk about the gram reaction, didn't we, in one of the earlier chapters, the gram positive and the gram negative cell walls. If you remember, the gram positive cells stained purple while the gram negative cells stained pink or red, right? And that was dependent upon um, the constituents of the cell wall. And so what this is showing here is the fact that in gram negative cells, which possess flagellum, flagella or a flagellum, the basal body is really composed of several rings, the, the most superficial of which is called the L ring. I'm not sure exactly where L comes from, but nonetheless, it's called the L ring. And the L ring is embedded in the outermost uh, thinner cell wall of the gram negative cells. And then there is a, a rod component and some additional rings at the very base of the hook that are embedded in the cell membrane of the gram negative cell. Compare and contrast that to our gram positive cell wall, okay, which has a thick cell wall, as illustrated here, with the rings only embedded in the cell membrane. So there's no rings here in the cell wall of a gram positive cell. Those are found exclusively in the cell membrane. So just be aware that there are differences in these basal bodies and how they're constructed. Back to our hook here containing the protein flagellin. You've got to think of the, the action of the flagellum in bacteria as um, a boat propeller. Like a, like a boat propeller, this flagellum will rotate in a 360 degree action. Okay, like a boat propeller rotates in forward clockwise and in reverse counterclockwise. And we'll talk a little bit about what happens when we have clockwise or counterclockwise rotation of the flagellum in just a moment. Keep in mind that the basal bodies don't move. It's the hook and the filament inside of it that does the rotating, okay, to help move the cell through its environment. With respect to arrangements of flagella, here are the four major uh, structural categories. The monotrichous arrangement, mono meaning one, and here we can see the flagellum extending from the 
uh, one end here of a bacillus shaped bacterium. This is magnified uh, 10,000 times. And are we looking at a scanning electron micrograph or a transmission electron micrograph here? If you said scanning, you were right. Yeah, because we're looking at sort of a 3D view, aren't we? Lophotrichus, illustrated in the upper right hand corner, is where we have flagella, more than one, right? Flagella extending out one end of the cell. Then we have amphitrichus, where we have flagella extending out both ends, kind of interesting. And finally, paratrichus, where we have flagella extending all over the place, not just on the ends, but all throughout the entire surface, on the entire surface of the cell. Now we know that again, flagella allow the cells, the bacterial cells to move through their environment. Why would they wanna do that? Well, oftentimes a bacterium might wanna move toward or away from a chemical in its environment. If that chemical is something that it can assimilate or utilize metabolically, it's gonna to move toward it. So we'll just use the phrase or the term food. If there's an organic material that the cell is gonna need or want, it's gonna to move toward it. And we use the term positive chemotaxis to describe movement toward a chemical, like food, let's say. What do you think negative chemotaxis might mean? Well, chemotaxis, again, meaning responding to a chemical, but negative would be the movement away from that chemical, right? Yeah, if there's a toxin in the environment or an antibiotic that another species of bacteria is secreting that is potentially harmful to the uh, bacterium in of interest, that cell may try to move away from that chemical because it could kill it. So positive and negative, moving toward and away, chemotactic meaning moving toward or away from a chemical. If we have photosynthetic bacteria, for example, that are able to utilize the sun's light, we could describe positive phototaxis, right? Plants are positively phototactic. If you've ever put a, a plant on a windowsill and let it sit there for a week, you probably notice that it tends to bend toward the light. Yeah, it's positively phototactic. And the same applies to certain types of bacteria, again, that are photosynthetic. They exhibit positive phototaxis. So I mentioned a few moments ago that those um, flagella, the hook and the filament, rotate 360 degrees like a boat propeller. If those structures rotate in a counterclockwise orientation, we would see what is defined as a run of the bacterial, bacterial cell through its environment, a straight run. If that hook and filament begin to uh, rotate clockwise, we would, um, see what's referred to as a tumble take place. So here we have, for example, um, a bacterium. It starts off here uh, in one location and it makes a run to another location where it could then tumble and stop. Okay. Now this is sort of de describing um, a particular uh, concentration gradient in the environment. Let's, let's say there's, there's food, increasing amounts of, of food here as we get into the darker uh, orange pink colors here on the right hand side of the square. Well, how does a flagellated cell move toward food, right? Positively chemotactic. Well, it, it begins not by just starting at one place and making a beeline to the food. What ends up often happening is it makes a run via counterclockwise rotation it then does a tumble, it clockwise rotates just temporarily, only to reorient and continue counterclockwise 
if in, in parting another run, then we have a tumble, we have another run, another tumble. The overall effect is sort of a, um, a very um, somewhat random set of tumbles and runs, but what's the overall effect though, right? The cell is eventually moving toward that attractant chemical in the environment. Again, think of food or some organic compound that the cell wants. So it doesn't make a beeline, it eventually gets there through a number of, of tumbles and runs, tumbles and runs, tumbles and runs. Kind of interesting. And of course, if there is a negative stimulus, then it's going to move away from that toxin, perhaps, via a number of tumbles and runs, tumbles and runs. And this particular slide just kind of talks a little more about that counterclockwise and clockwise movement of the flagellum. So you can just kind of look that over. Okay, another very fascinating structure that some bacteria have to allow it to move through its environment is found in a particular group of bacteria called the spirochetes. And these spirochetes are sort of corkscrew shaped bacterial cells. And they have inside of them an internal flagellum or flagella. Typically, it's more than one. So internal flagella that are contractile, the proteins there. The flagellum in there is contractile. And so when we look at, for example, a sketch of a of a spirochete, we can see the sort of center here, if you will, the, the cytoplasmic zone here in, in pink. And then in yellow are the uh, periplasmic flagella on the surface here of the cell membrane. In this cross-sectional view, so if we're taking the cell, we're cutting it like so, cross-section. Let's take a look at what we've got. So here's the um, cell membrane in white. Here we have the periplasmic flagella in yellow on the surface. Quite a few of them, aren't there? And so what ends up happening here as, is as these um, proteins contract and relax and contract and relax, you get this serpentine movement of the spirochete uh, in its environment. And I'm not going to uh, play this YouTube video, but I do want you to watch it. It's a um, like a 10 or 15 second clip uh, of spirochetes moving back and forth uh, in their watery environment. It's, it's kind of an interesting little video. So make sure you take a look at that. Characteristic of spirochetes. Another important appendage that some bacteria have that have no role to play in motility, but rather help the cell to anchor itself to a substrate or to permit materials to move between cells. That's what we wanna talk about next, the fimbriae and pili. Let's talk about the fimbriae first. Uh, this again is a term that would, in, it would denote plural. And in this particular interesting photograph of E. coli, we can see the stained fimbriae here as these yellow spike-like structures that are extending out from the, the cell wall. This is a gram-negative bacillus, the E. coli is. And in this uh, very beautiful stain, we can see what looks like bristles. All those yellow bristles are fimbriae. And in the case of E. coli, what they use those for is to attach themselves, again, to some substrate. In this lower electron micrograph, we're looking at a simple columnar cell. So this is likely um, from the intestine. In fact, it says uh, intestinal microvilli. So think back to ANP1 when we looked at the histology of simple columnar that lines the villi of your small intestine. This is just one cell, okay? This is the surface of one cell. Here's their microvilli, which you remember increased the surface area for maximum absorption of nutrients. Remember that? And here we've got, oh, I don't know, a dozen or so E. coli cells shown here in, in gray. 
and they are utilizing their fimbriae to attach to the surface of the cell, literally to the microvilli. That's a really interesting photograph. Now, we can all, I think, appreciate the fact that if we um, look in our kitchen drain, pull that metal drain up, sometimes we see this slimy, gunky looking stuff, right? Or um, if you walk along the edge of a pond or a lake in the summertime and you, and you pull up a rock uh, and you scrape away maybe the green algae on that rock, you might see a slippery material underneath that. That's likely bacteria that are usual, utilizing their fimbriae to attach themselves to the rock or whatever the substrate might be. We're gonna talk about biofilms a little bit later, but biofilms often are composed of cells that are usual, utilizing their fimbriae to attach again to some substrate. Now I have here listed catheters um, and that's a big problem in the healthcare industry with regard to heart catheters, for example, or catheters putting it into the urinary system. They can eventually uh, be lined with bacteria that are utilizing their fimbriae to attach to the inner surface of that catheter. Not a good thing. So a little bit later, we'll talk about biofilms. Pili is the other structure we want to talk a little bit about. This is again plural. If I'm talking about a single one of these, I would use the term pilus, P-I-L-U-S, pilus, or pili, plural. Most common in gram-negative cells, what the pili tend to do, in some species, they can act sort of like the fimbriae did in helping the cell adhere to a substrate. Um, but in other types of cells, this particular structure is used in a process called conjugation, which we'll talk a lot more about in chapter nine. But I wanna to refer to this diagram for just a moment, or this photograph, I should say. And here we can see um, the uh, dark black sort of uh, halo, if you will, that are, that's found on the surface of these three cells as, they, uh, as they're indicated here on the label. These are fimbriae that no doubt help it attach to a substrate. But what, what also is very interesting here is this set of pili extending from this cell to these two cells. So what we're looking at here uh, is what is referred to as a sex pilus. Each one of these would be called a sex pilus. And across this pilus bridge, if you will, would be the movement of genetic material, DNA actually, from one cell to another. This is one way in which, for example, a cell that might be um, resistant to a particular antibiotic might be able to provide that same resistance, drug resistance, to these two cells via a sex pilus. And what would happen oftentimes is this donor cell would transfer genetic material to the recipient cells. And those recipient cells would, would basically uh, be provided an instruction booklet in the form of the DNA to allow it to perhaps construct a capsule or whatever the case may be to protect it from that uh, antibiotic. So we'll talk a lot more about this in chapter nine. It's really very, very interesting. Okay, moving on to another structure that we find in um, many types of bacteria, the external uh, component of bacteria, um, is something called the S layer. Now, I don't have a slide that specifically talks about the S layer, so I want you to take some time and look over that section that is entitled Bacterial Surface Coatings, the S layer, and glycocalyx. I want to talk about the glycocalyx, which would be found internal to the S layer. Okay. The slime layer. Not all bacteria have a slime layer. Some do. Uh, and this is a sketch that sort of depicts this rather loose, organized, 
structure here on the very surface of the cell. And other bacteria would possess as part of their glycocalyx, something called a capsule, which is a little more organized, a little more tightly attached as the sketch sort of uh, implies here in the, on the slide. What's the difference between a slime layer and a capsule? Well, one thing that these two structures can provide, especially the slime layer, is providing the cell from becoming dehydrated and losing nutrients. That's a real important function uh, of the slime layer, generally of cells. It protects them from dehydration and loss of nutrients. The capsule, tends to be more um, uh, important in providing protection to the cell from other white blood cells that might want to try to phagocytize that cell. It also can impart pathogenicity to the cell. And we'll talk more about this again in an upcoming layer, uh, chapter. Um, so if you are encapsulated, you tend to be more pathogenic than if you're non-encapsulated for the most part. In this particular photograph, we're looking at some colonies here um, that possess capsules. And we know that by this kind of large uh, colonial appearance that's, that's shiny. The cells here that are, are colonies, I should say, that are very, very tiny would be considered non-encapsulated. Okay, so it's it's merely a, a difference between having big, big, big colonies that are sort of shiny versus those that are very, very tiny and tend not to be quite as shiny. This particular right-hand uh, photograph, um, taken with a compound like microscope, is showing some individual cells, and this is. Um, uh, showing the capsule here of the cell, this kind of white halo that extends around the, 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 the centermost region of the cell. This is indicative of a capsule. We're going to be doing a capsule stain coming up in lab in a couple of weeks where you're hopefully going to see this. Um, this is probably Klebsiella, uh, both uh, growing on the agar plate here as well as the capsule stain of some individual Klebsiella cells. And um, we will also describe in just a few moments this notion of biofilms. We mentioned it a few moments ago with regard to the pili. But the glycocalyx layer of some cells can also help in helping that cell adhere to a substrate and in help in the formation of the biofilm. In fact, let's talk a little bit about this. Um, we'll spend more time on biofilms coming up in another chapter, but there is a section in your book that talks a little bit, little bit about biofilms. They're fascinating structures. Um, basically, the way that a biofilm would form um, on the inner lining of a catheter uh, or in the bottom of a uh, drain of your kitchen sink, that slimy material that you got to wipe off every couple months. What ends up happening here, our bacteria will initially settle on a surface and these cells that initially uh, sort of inoculate the catheter or inoculate the surface of a, of a new drain sink um, or sink drain, I should say, um, are called planktonic cells. Planktonic means that they're free swimming forms of bacteria. So they will settle on the surface of a tooth, on the surface of a catheter, on the surface of a uh, drain of a sink. And there they will uh, undergo this metamorphosis, if you will. They'll start to secrete uh, extracellular proteins, they will begin to produce polysaccharides and glycoproteins and pili and fimbriae and slime layers and capsules to help these cells stick uh, 
tenaciously to the surface. Um, they'll also actually begin to grow. You'll, you'll get what's, what's uh, kind of viewed as this, almost like a fungus that, this is microscopic of course, but it's gonna kind of begin to elevate above the surface of the, of the uh, substrate, sort of begins to mature and thicken a bit, which is just denoted here as number four, in increased cell division, new cells are recruited into the biofilm, and eventually what happens is new planktonic cells will develop in the colony, and they will in turn be released out into the environment. So here again are the planktonic cells released from the biofilm that will begin to uh, swim, perhaps using their, their flagella, and can then re-inoculate other surfaces. This uh, scanning electron micrograph shows a biofilm on the surface of a tooth. And we all have this on our teeth, believe it or not. Yeah, so we can see the, the pink rod-shaped cells here and uh, the enamel of the tooth. Well, actually, there's not just the pink guys, but if you look really close, you can see some other uh, yellow, orange, uh, well, not yellow, orange, but rather green shaped bacillus shaped cells. So you, you don't have just necessarily a single species of bacteria. You can have a whole host of, of different species actually communicating with one another. Again, we'll talk more about this in an upcoming chapter. But it's a fascinating ecology, well orchestrated um, community of cells. This is simply um, an electron micrograph that shows again a biofilm on a catheter. So the catheter uh, is material, the catheter is shown here sort of in gray. And then here are our cells indicating bacteria that have infiltrated and are growing on the surface of that catheter. Pretty cool stuff. Okay, let's um, move from the external components to what's called the cell envelope, composed of an outer membrane found only in the gram-negative cells, a cell wall, and finally a cell membrane. And this is sort of, again, the sequence that you would tend to find outermost to innermost. Okay, so we're talking about structures that are um, external to the cytoplasm of the cell. Again, an inner cell membrane and an outer cell wall. One is next to the other. The major purpose of these structures is to impart a structural integrity to the cell, but also in the case of the inner membrane especially, and to some extent the outer cell wall, um, these are selectively permeable. In other words, the cell can allow materials to pass across the envelope, either moving out of the cell or perhaps materials moving into the cell. Kind of depends upon the chemical that's moving and to what extent you have um, you know, a well-developed outer cell wall or not. Whether we're talking about a gram-positive or a gram-negative cell wall, let's think of its primary function, as we said a moment ago, uh, being uh, providing structural stability to the cell. And so when we look at what the cell wall is made up of, we come to this important structure called peptidoglycan. This is the primary component of cell walls. Again, whether it's gram-positive or gram-negative, peptidoglycan is found in both. So what is this peptidoglycan material? Well, if you look at the word peptido, what does that refer to? <clears throat> it refers to peptide or protein. Glycan refers to carbohydrate. 
So when you look at the chemistry of peptidoglycan, you'll find that it's made up of alternating, repeating chains of long sugars cross-linked <clears throat> by peptides. Okay, so in this particular sketch, where it says NAM, NAG, NAM, NAG, NAM, NAG, these are the carbohydrate components of the peptidoglycan. And if you think back to chapter two of ANP1, when we talked about monosaccharides like glucose, glucose is a hexose sugar. It's a, it's a six-sided ring. Do you remember that? You should remember that. So look at these sugars. They're six-sided, aren't they? So it tells us these are monosaccharides. <clears throat> now, you don't need to know what NAG and NAM refer to, but there are certain types of sugars. They're connected to one another, as we can see here, alternating NAM and NAG in long strands. And then these brown uh, spherical structures are denoting peptide uh, molecules that sort of help to link these NAM and NAG together. Okay. Now let's begin to look at the differences between gram positive cell walls and gram negative cell walls, remembering that both contain peptidoglycan. So that's a common chemical that both cell walls possess. But there are significant differences between the two as well that we'll point out now. The takeaway message here is that in gram-positive cell walls, we have thick peptidoglycan. And so here we've got a uh, stained transmission electron micrograph that illustrates in brown the thick peptidoglycan of a gram-positive cell wall. Now, in from that, let's go to the little sketch. In from the thick peptidoglycan in a gram-positive cell wall, we have what's referred to as the periplasmic space, sort of here as a, a, a light gray region, okay? And the periplasmic space is basically found between the thick peptidoglycan and the inner cell membrane, denoted here in yellow. Okay, and we can find those very same structures here in the electron micrograph. The outer thick peptidoglycan, here's the periplasmic space that's basically acting to store enzymes for the cell. And then here is our cell membrane or plasma membrane here in yellow before we encounter the cytoplasm of the cell. This would of course be the outside external region. Now, going back to the peptidoglycan, which we know is made up of NAM and NAG, cross-bridged with peptides, there is, in addition to that chemical making up the cell wall, these two structures, tachoic acid and lipotachoic acid. And as it mentions here, these help in providing maintenance to the cell wall. They allow for enlargement of the cell wall as the cell begins to divide. And in certain sister situations can help pathogens like this cell bind to some tissue. So it can be beneficial to the cell by helping it adhere. I'm gonna show you these in just a moment when we compare and contrast the gram-positive and gram-negative cell walls side by side. But just remember, gram-positive cell wall, thick peptidoglycan embedded within which is tachoic acid and lipotachoic acid molecules. A single periplasmic space and then an inner cell membrane. This sort of defines the cell envelope of a gram-positive cell. Here's the gram-negative cell wall, a little bit different. How is it different? Well, we have in gram-negative cell walls, let's just go right to the sketch here. We'll talk more about the narration here in just a moment, the words. Here's the sketch. Here's the transmission electron micrograph that's been falsely colored to bring out these features. Let's go from innermost, outermost, Here's our cell membrane. So that's nothing unique. We saw that earlier. 
cell membrane, the first of two periplasmic spaces. Here's the peptidoglycan, which is very, very thin compared to the gram-positive cell wall, a secondary periplasmic space before we encounter an outer membrane. Gram-positive cell walls don't have outer membranes, just gram-negative cell walls. Okay, so again, inner cell membrane, periplasmic space number one, thin peptidoglycan, periplasmic space number two, outer membrane. This outer membrane, shown here in green, contains lipopolysaccharides, which impart toxicity to the gram-negative cell walls. Um, this is generally why gram-negative cells tend to be more pathogenic in general than gram-positive cells. They have this outer lipopolysaccharide material in its outer membrane that tends to provide pathogenicity via toxicity to the cell. Now, in addition to providing this endotoxin characteristic that we'll talk more about in an upcoming chapter, notice it also says may help function as receptor sites and also blocking the immune response. So this again is why it tends to be more pathogenic. Immune cells like white cells have a more difficult time knocking these cells out because of the outer membrane. And as we'll also see in a few moments when we compare and contrast the two, which I think is the next slide, um, the outer membrane of gram positive cell walls or gram negative cell walls also have what are called porin proteins. So this gets back to the idea that there, there is selective permeability, remember, to the, to the envelope. And here we're talking, of course, about just a part of that cell envelope, um, which is the outer membrane. But the same uh, idea of selective permeability really can be applied to all three layers to some extent. But we're going to see these porin proteins in just a moment. All right, so here's that sketch that I was referring to that compares and contrasts the gram-negative from the gram-positive cell walls. And this is really something that you should be spending a lot of time studying because you're gonna to wanna to know the differences between gram-positive and gram-negative. As a quick review, here we've got in gram-positive cell walls, a thick peptidoglycan, thick, thick, thick. Here's our tachoic acid molecules which are only sticking out um, really the outer uh, portion of the cell uh, envelope, out, kind of embedded here in the, in the peptidoglycan, but kind of extending, sticking out here. And then the lipopteichoic acid is really anchored in the cell membrane and extends really through the periplasmic space and then ultimately up through the peptidoglycan until it reaches the surface. So there is that structural difference between tachoic and lipotachoic acids. Um, here's our single periplasmic space. And then of course, here is the innermost cell membrane. This should look familiar to you, by the way. This cell membrane, as we'll talk more about in just a few minutes, looks quite similar to the cell membrane of eukaryotic cells. By that, I mean phospholipid bilayers, right, bilayer, excuse me, uh, with embedded proteins shown here in blue. Here's our gram-negative cell wall. Let's start from the inside and work out. Here is the cell membrane or plasma membrane. Again, phospholipid bilayer, embedded proteins. Here's the first periplasmic space. Here is the thin peptidoglycan. What they don't have a label here, oh yeah, they do, okay. Um, here's the second periplasmic space. You can't quite see it very well here, but it lies just external to the peptidoglycan and just under the outer membrane, okay? So two periplasmic spaces. And then here is finally our outer membrane containing those porin proteins that allow material to pass through that. And then you can look super close and see these little uh, lipo polysaccharides, these little uh, black, they look like flagella, they're not. Uh, these are the, the lipopolysaccharides that are extending uh, externally uh, from the outer membrane. 
do note that uh, in addition to the lipopolysaccharides, we also have lipoproteins shown here in yellow embedded within the bilayer. And these tend to not uh, ex extend through the entire bilayer and, and, and come to the surface. They're sort of embedded in the very uh, innermost portion of the outer membrane. But when you look at this outer membrane and compare it to the inner membrane, again, it looks quite similar, doesn't it? Other than the fact that you've got porn proteins here in the outer membrane and lipopolysaccharides, as well as lipoproteins, but you've got a phospholipid bilayer, okay? So there's a lot of similarity in some respects between the outer membrane and the inner membrane, with the exception again shown here as the lipopolysaccharides and the porn proteins and the lipoproteins. You've got a table in your book that does a nice job comparing and contrasting the two. Again, I would spend some time looking at this and, and flipping back to the preceding diagram so that you're comfortable with the major differences between gram-positive and gram-negative cell walls. Really important stuff. Um, we spent some time in one of the earlier chapters um, talking about the difference between gram-positive and gram-negative cell walls as it pertains to the gram stain. So I'm not gonna go over this. It would be helpful perhaps after you've studied this to go back to that diagram that I showed you in one of the earlier chapters. And I think that's gonna make more sense to you. And we'll be doing this gram stain coming up in lab, um, I think in about two or three weeks. Um, just a few comments about some kind of interesting atypical cell walls that some bacteria possess, A meaning without. So this, these sort of, these two groups of bacteria that I'm going to mention here, the two genera, the mycobacterium and the nocardia, um, have a lot of mycolic acid in their cell wall. Now these guys would be considered gram positive. Um, but embedded in that thick peptidoglycan is this interesting waxy mycolic acid. And having mycolic acid means that these uh, cells of the genus Mycobacterium and of the genus Nocardia tend to be very, very pathogenic and resistant to um, white cells that are trying to en engulf and phagocytize you know, these sorts of cells. And I'll just say from the outset that the bacteria that I tend to think about when I think about um, mycobacterium, the species that I often think about is mycobacterium tuberculosis, causing, of course, the disease tuberculosis. Um, nocardia, there's uh, some types of nocardia that are also extremely pathogenic. But in lab, in a, in a number of weeks, we're going to do an acid fast stain on mycobacterium, not tuberculosis. We'll use a much nicer, friendlier species to stain. But this is um, going to be a special stain that we have to employ steam and a special type of stain called carbofusion to penetrate the very, very waxy cell wall. Um, if we didn't do the acid fast stain, we'd have a hard time uh, staining and, and differentiating my, mycobacterium and nocardia from other types of gram-positive bacteria. So the acid fast stain is sort of the differential stain that we're going to be using to allow us to see mycobacterium and certain types of nocardia. Um, nocardia um, can cause leprosy, or, or um, I think some folks call it Hansen's disease. I'd like you to read over that section in chapter four that talks about the cell wall and infections. Very interesting section of the chapter, so please check that out. And then we have some bacteria that don't have any cell wall at all, or not in the conventional sense of having um, peptidoglycan in it, like our gram-positive or gram-negative cells do. And we're going to just make brief mention of this genera called mycoplasma, where the cell wall has a lot of sterols. These are, are 
types of uh, lipids that impart a particular um, pleomorphic characteristic to these very, very tiny cells. By pleomorphic, we mean many shapes. You can have lots of different sizes and shapes um, to mycoplasma due to their very atypical cell wall. We talked about the cell membrane just a few moments ago. We mentioned that it is selectively permeable. We mentioned that it uh, looks quite similar from a structural viewpoint to the cell membrane or plasma membrane of eukaryotic cells. In fact, if I were to take this sketch and throw it up on a slide and ask you, where have you seen this before? You might reference the eukaryotic cell membrane. Same overall architecture applies to bacterial cell membranes. The differences lie in some of the chemicals, some of the carbohydrates and some of the proteins that extend from the either the peptido or either from the bilayer or from the protein. So in essence, what do we have? We have a phospholipid bilayer with embedded proteins, okay, as shown here, some of which are transport proteins allowing things in and out. Um, other proteins like this interval protein shown here in green can act as a binding site for a chemical to impart some change to the cell. The cell will respond to the presence of that uh, chemical binded, bound rather to its uh, protein. And so in essence, just understand that like a eukaryotic cell membrane, a prokaryotic cell membrane uh, regulates what enters and leaves the cell and can have um, other very similar properties to bacteria or to eukaryotic cell membranes. Okay, I'm going to end um, this particular Zoom um, lecture. And uh, in the second half of chapter, five, uh, chapter four, we will focus on internal structures.